DevOps admin David from Trivial Solutions I owe you. And uh, I mentioned in my first video that I will talk about uh, business requirements only. I'll here talk about also business requirements, but we'll touch on technical details also. And uh, today I will explain what file systems, what file system I use in ZFS. I believe it's the best file system all around. It saves my skin many times and uh, it saves a lot of time in general because usually file systems like people think these bare bones like NTFS, ext 4 ZFS, but you know, ZFS is like completely different. It changes the way you think about file systems, what they should be. So, okay, so first I will I will not, this will not be like tutorial, there are plenty of those like how to create zpools, data sets, how to backup stuff, ZFS send, ZFS receive, you know, whatever. But I rather just uh, like to spend this time to like sell ZFS, like from a business perspective, what does it, like what does it give, not like exact technical details, but you know, what are the benefits, why would someone use it? So, okay, let's start. So, I mentioned in the first video, like, how do I like my infrastructure to be run, that I like to be able to revert things. So, this is where ZFS comes into play, like, big part. Because one of the killer features, I think it's the killer feature of ZFS is snapshots. And most of our file systems don't have this except BTRFS, but... Uh, it's not uh, production ready like the last time I checked. So what snapshots allow you to do is, like say you want to perform a database upgrade and you, like I dealt with five terabyte data sets and <laughs> if you perform an upgrade and upgrade corrupts your data, well, you're screwed. You're gonna sp need to spend a lot of internet bandwidth and time to get the data set back. What with ZFS you do, you before the upgrade, like say you have big data sets, say five terabytes, I don't know if it's considered big by today's standards, but whatever, you perform a snapshot, so, and then you perform upgrade. You test it, do things work, like as they should, right? And if they work, you see after a few days or a week or whatever, snapshots don't consume space. So, they do not duplicate space. So if you have five terabyte uh, snapshot, uh, five terabyte data set, if you perform a snapshot, you don't need another five terabytes, right? Snapshot only consumes the difference between what happened after the snapshot and the current state. So if, uh, you know, after a snapshot, after a grade, your database wrote, say, 10 gigs, to the five terabytes, it changed to 10 gigs of data. That's only 10 gigs of extra space, right? So if everything is great, you just delete the snapshot and then reclaim those 10 gigs. And then uh, the latest state becomes, you delete the snapshot and you live with the current state, right? But if things go wrong, then you can just roll back a snapshot, roll back the application and then you can maybe experiment, figure out what's what's wrong. And that leads into the next point. ZFS doesn't only allow you to do snapshots, you can fork an entire data, bit, a data set. So like if you have five terabytes of data set and it's running in production, it's actively being modified, you can perform snapshot while data set is running, database is serving production requests Right, you fork a separate copy of the snapshot that consumes the same amount of space, and then you can say run a Postgres instance, bind the Docker image to the mount point of the snapshot, like the forked data set, and then you can, uh, you know, possibly test an upgrade without affecting production at all. Or you can, what's more interesting, even you can uh, try to perform database migration right because sometimes database migrations it's not always clear if they take a lot of time sometimes if you uh like for instance in my sql there i remember one case i don't remember the specific query but it was something with adding or removing a column not sure 
But anyway, with that, you can perform the migration and you can actually figure out how long it would take to perform the migration. Right? Of course, it will not be the same as running it in production, but you, know, you can get an idea how long a migration would take. And if it takes like, uh, you know, a few hours, you might prefer to do it in a night when there's less traffic and whatnot. So there are a lot of interesting things you can do with the snapshots. I think it's, if ZFS didn't have this feature, frankly, I wouldn't probably be using it, right? So this is the killer feature snapshot. It saves a lot of time and it can save a lot of bacon. Now, <clears throat> another point it adds, I think it adds to simplicity. So ZFS, unlike most file systems, it checksums everything. It detects disk error. So if application wrote, you know, a certain block to disk, then it's checksummed in ZFS, saved in multiple places on a disk. And uh, if uh, application requests that block back, ZFS reads the block. It may be in memory, but if it reads from disk, it will read the block, check, Okay, it does it match the checksum that I stored? If it doesn't match the checksum, you know, it will read another copy. Of course, uh, if you have a redundancy, but it will detect disk error, right? If one disk has erroneous block of data, then it will fetch another copy, try to fix the original error and will say, increment your disk error counter. So you might have an idea which disk is doing funny things or is about to fail and whatnot. So you can trust data that is saved with ZFS. And in ext4, for instance, there's no checksumming, nothing. So if you, you shut down the node and you uh, open uh, like disk, like a block device and you swap bytes here and there for file system being unaware, you'll just get corrupted data and you wouldn't ever know, right? So I think it, it also allows me sleep at night better knowing when I store my data as ZFS. So another feature that I really like and I use is, you know, when disk fails uh, in a typical setup, like for instance, um, I have time working with an Elasticsearch setup and of course everyone used ext4. So, you know, a short fails, right? Elasticsearch stops. Okay, your disk fails. Your Elasticsearch instance is down. But, you know, it's bearable because there were many of them and it's replicated and whatnot. But the single instance is down. What ZFS does, right? Your disk can fail if you have redundant setup and application wouldn't even notice. ZFS knows, okay, this disk failed. And if ZFS sees, okay, I have spares, then it replaces the failed disk automatically, right? So I just, I like using spares because, you know, I, I don't like being under stress. And I know if uh, I have a spare or two on my server, then, <laughs> you know, stuff just keeps running. And one day I might wake up and alerting says, that, hey, you have one uh, less spare. That means disk was replaced. And of course, all the disks that are in order synced, everything's working nice, right? But uh, there's no stress. I can just, you know, order, hey, this disk needs to replace, but the system keeps on running and there's no stress as opposed to, you know, disk fails and then your system is degraded and, oh, you know, let's, replace this quick, right? It might take some time in other instances to replace this. It might not be instant always. So I usually keep spares and I allow ZFS to replace my disks. So yeah, apps don't know about failure. So I mentioned this already. And data set transfer is easy. So I've done this hundreds of times. With ZFS, you can just like production app is running, like it's a database, or for instance, a blockchain instance, like uh, you need to create a few replicas, say of Ethereum, Geef client, right? So you just, the one instance is synced and running, you perform a snapshot, the snapshot is frozen in place, right? But the app keeps on running, 
and then you just send the snapshot data set to our server via ZFS send. Like it sends uh, 500 megs per second, so it's much faster than our sync. Syncing files, you don't need to stop your infrastructure, right? So <laughs> what I used to do with our sync before we had ZFS was I would uh, R sync the files of a running database, right? And then I'd need to stop it real quick and R sync again, right? So it would uh, detect the changes and have the latest snapshot, right? So that was like a workaround I did first. R sync clones bulk of the data, data diverges, right? The snapshot of first R sync is not corrupted. But then you can stop the original instance and then real, real quick R sync to tail that's left. So I used to do this workaround. I don't need to do this anymore because I just use ZFS snapshot, ZFS send. Super simple, very easy. And compare compare that to like ext4 or XFS. Like what are the features of those file systems? They may be a little faster in some cases, but you know, I just assume you have small scale at the start, right? Only if I see the evidence like monitoring, alerting Grafana dashboard show me, okay, like uh, disk IO times on disk are increasing, latency is increasing. Yeah, then I might need to do something about it, but otherwise, these are just super bare bone and ZFS just saves so much time with these features mentioned above that, you know, for me, it's very easy choice to pick ZFS over this. And another huge time save that uh, other people deal with, uh, with other file systems is I don't mess with partitioning at all, right? So I will tell you how I, uh, I run my setup later so, but uh, I will just tell right now that uh, there was a case that uh, you know we used traditional file system and uh, Kafka like we have 24 disks on a server and every se separate uh, disk is formatted separately and given to Kafka you know use this disk space right and uh, then you might have bigger Kafka partitions and they don't fit in the single disk and then you have problems. Disks are not utilized evenly, they're imbalanced, right? You know, that's what happens when you give like 24 separate partitions. So instead with ZFS, what I do today, instead just connect those 24 disks into single rate 10.0 and then use all that storage for all instances and uh, all of the I.O. for RAID 1 setup. And we can transition that how I run this because I'm just getting to this point. What I do today is all the disks, all the disks except some spares, right? So if I have 24 disks array, I'd have two spare disks and 22 disks I connect as RAID 10.0. So this is how it looks. Like I show four disk setup. And so this is two stripes. These are one, two, three, four disks. And these are mirror copies of each other, right? These two have different data from these two. And all the writes are distributed in parallel across T. So writes are twice more performant than on one disk. But reads, on the other hand, are four times more performant. You have four times more read I.O. and two times more write I.O. Right? With such setup. So I just allow, I just connect all the disks I have into RAID 10 .0 in such setup. So this would be like, uh, this is two stripes. So in 22 disk setup, these would be nine more stripes. I have all this IO and I give all of it to any application that need. And I just create data sets, bind them to this huge Z pool of disks. And then if some application wants to burst and use a lot of IO, 
it will have great IO performance because every disc will help, right? Because like, <laughs> we're like the rocker fellers of disc IO. We assume that not all applications will request all IO at once, right? Well, I wish OpenZFS had this, ZFS on Linux. I wish that it had the feature uh, that there were IO quotas. So far it has storage quotas, so you can restrict application so it wouldn't take up all space. But last time I checked, uh, you hopefully it will be by the time you watch this video, you can't restrict IO disk quotas to so that, you know, all applications uh, might have IO. Uh, what I do typically now is, you know, if one application is really greedy, then I have monitoring, I see that, oh, you know, this IO is used and I detect that application and you do something about it. But usually, you know, single application has IO of all the disks combined, right? And it's enough for everybody, right? So it's very efficient use of hardware. And, you know, in the worst case, if some app really needs like separate disks, I might move it to a less busy server, right? I might move, I have many servers like this. And they're connected, uh, they have SSD disks connected with RAID 1.0. And I might move an app that really requires dedicated disk I.O. to another server that is, less that is less busy or empty, right? So, you know, that's how I roll. I just connect all disks, have few spares, and all of that space is free for use. I don't deal with partitions like, you know, when you assign space for a VM and then it runs out and you can never really guess how much uh, disk space you will need so you know just give it all and it will take as much as you need if you move one app out of this server you will reclaim all that space you don't need to fiddle with partitions delete part that partition expand that you know you don't fiddle with that you just delete data set and you're done <laughs> the space is reclaimed so that's a huge time save not fiddling with partitions, partitions, just give it all you need. And uh, how I roll is some people, there is this new thing called CSI, Container Storage Interface. It's popularized by Kubernetes these days. And uh, it abstracts storage like, okay, my storage may be on Ceph, my storage may be on EBS, uh, on Amazon, Elastic Block Storage. And it, like IO becomes over network and I'm like, why do you do that? Like, why would you want to, <laughs> your app is here, right? And if it's on the same server, it uses the disk. It's the most reliable way to use the disk. If you're on the same server and you just go locally through wires through one server and access the device you need. What people do now these days is like, this is the app. It goes to our server for this and it, across the network bounds, right? So, of course, this can never be as reliable as this. <laughs> so, I don't, apparently, a lot of people just like... Uh, I can't explain this any other way, but a lot of people just like pain and suffering, I guess. I don't know how else to explain it. So, I simply... I do things very simply. Right, I run uh, containers on Nomad, I bind the directories, host volumes, I can make that, you know, only that container is scheduled on that host and it will access only that volume, so it's, and it's very simple, it's very reliable, it, it works great and you don't need to worry about what happens here, like there are over 60 uh, CSI drivers for different providers with different solidity with different variation of bugs like why would I do why would I do that I, I don't understand you know, but whatever so and the last point is oh I want to talk about caveats so I don't well, when you install open ZFS on Linux like one caveat is you should benchmark your setup uh, with uh, SSD bench 
not the SSD benchmark tool, but uh, I can't remember. I'll put the, the description what I mean or uh, text in the video. You benchmark to figure out what works and uh, for modern SSDs you use 4K per sector, so otherwise uh, by default on ZFS it's like 16K sectors size I think and the record size of a data set is 128K. So if you want the best performance you need to align sector sizes and I do uh, the, and, uh, I do the RAM cache also. Uh, I add a lot of RAM so that uh, you know you can I didn't mention this but there is like a, I do a fast write mode a lot of applications uh, they can just write to the disk and ZFS will only write it in RAM but acknowledge it okay the write is done but uh, the write is only in RAM and what happens then application sees very quick writes right but it will never corrupt your data if your application is like a traditional database like Postgres or MySQL it has write ahead log if it returned to you that uh, not that commit succeeded but anyway the database process you can kill it at any time for a good database good databases do that, that you can kill them at any time and they will never corrupt the data so in this setup, you might lose rights. So obviously you don't want to do that with something like payments, right? If user made a payment, you better have that in the disk, right? You know, but a lot of other cases like blockchain nodes, if Ethereum node is syncing and uh, then uh, you lose, you can lose five seconds of data by default because what happens is your rights there's a ZFS snapshot, like not snapshot, but I remember, don't remember, like, is it Uber block? Like, uh, your writes happen in RAM, and then all that buffer of random writes gets written as like sequential IO to disks. And then another second passes, and then there's this buffer in RAM that's, and then, it also gets flushed to disk every five seconds. So if I can run this this way, I do it because uh, it's very fast, but you need to understand the caveats that you might lose up to five seconds of data. An application will never see that it wrote something to the disk in a timeline, right? Application wrote A, B, and C. So your application will can only ever see state like it wrote everything, it wrote uh, everything but C, or it wrote only A. It will never have state like it wrote A and it wrote C, but it never wrote B. So if on a good applications, it works consistently like databases, and I it saves a lot of I.O. because uh, all the I.O. then that is buffered in RAM then turns sequentially. So that's another good trick uh, ZFS has is disabling sync on data set when you can. So yeah, so that's a little technical. And uh, you know, hopefully I sold you ZFS and uh, I recommend uh, reading uh, two books on ZFS if you're more interested in how to use it. I will not go into details and all the tutorials. I'm just telling you why I use ZFS and why it saves time and hopefully I convince you that you know you can get your life uh, rolling a lot easier if you use ZFS versus other file systems. Okay so this was David from trivialsolutions.io and uh, see you in the next parts of what I use in my infrastructure. Peace.